Hello everybody and welcome. It's me, Ghost Critic, with a, another Sunday comic book review video. Uh, I had a big stack of 10 comic books to get through this week. Fortunately, they were all pretty darn good. And I thought I'd change it a little bit this week. Uh, you're all going to get my thoughts and opinions, as always, on my books. But generally, I order my books from what I enjoyed the least to what is my pick of the week. And it occurred to me that a question that I get asked a great deal is, how do I choose which books to read first? Kind of like a reading order. And it does kind of change from week to week if there's something that I'm really excited to read I will read it first I won't leave it to the end or if there's something that I'm really not looking forward to reading I put it to the bottom of the pile and sometimes it's just a crapshoot I'll just pick up a comic and I'll start reading it so I thought this week rather than doing it in order of worst to best I'm going to review them in the order that I read them in. Now this doesn't necessarily mean that the first book I read is my pick of the week. You're going to have to wait right till the end of the video to find out what that was. So we're going to kick off this week. The first book that was on my pile that I read was Valiant Comics. Uh, Exo Man of War, issue number four, the start of the new storyline general. The last three issues were called Soldier. And it did kind of feel like this may be Arik, our main character, and kind of moving up the ranks of this army that he's kind of been dragged into. Uh, but it's not quite that just yet, but I can feel it getting that way. Um, what we have here is our kind of main core of this army, these five or six um, characters all banding together to go on what appears to be yet another suicide mission, but with Arik at the lead heading the charge, uh, they overcome this uh, enemy that they're going against. But there are kind of rumbles in here that, uh, and um, discussions from certain characters that maybe they're fighting on the wrong side. And it makes for a, an interesting um, storyline for Arik to kind of manoeuvre around that maybe he is being used, that, that maybe, like I say, he isn't uh, fighting for the right side. And I can see Matt Kent kind of laying the groundwork uh, for future storylines and maybe Arik and his, his little band of kind of misfits could turn the tables on uh, their current leaders and masters. Um, what he gets at the end of this issue, he gets a kind of uh, a rest period before he goes on his next mission and he goes back to see what I guess is his wife on this planet and the reveal of the kind of exo man of war armor, I'm presuming. And this is again, Matt Kent has been kind of laying the groundwork on this as the little bit of metal that makes up the Exo Man of War, I guess. I don't know the full history of Exo Man of War, but it's kind of been enticing him and um, making him want to use the armor more and that he is a, a product of war. He cannot have an easy life. He can't have that um, just normal family um, environment. He is a person of war and will always be that. Uh, but Arik, as much as he gets involved in all these wars and these battles, um, he is hopeful that one day he can kind of push that all aside and live a nice restful life. Um, just a great book all rounder. Um, I mean, I know I say it all the time and that's because it's kind of true. It's very reminiscent of Conan, but just in a kind of sci-fi setting. Uh, and that doesn't make this book um, an original in any way, although, you know, there are elements that we've seen many times, but there's just something about Matt Kint's writing and like I say, all this, all this great groundwork he's working on for what 
we must hope is going to be future storylines. It's just really interesting and intriguing and makes you want to read more. Um, I've heard concerns from people here on YouTube that it's not the regular writer on here, uh, not the regular writer, the regular artist. Um, we've now got Doug Braithwaite on here. And to be fair, I didn't really notice the difference. It's still really great artwork. And I think that probably is more to do with um, with the colourist who is still Diego Rodriguez on here. Um, who, is, like I say, he's just a great colourist and um, seems to work well with any other artist that he's kind of paired with. So it's still a fantastic looking book. Um, and I'm just dying to read the next issue. Next on the reading list was from DC. It's issue 25, the supersized anniversary edition of The Flash, written by Joshua Williamson. And fortunately, this was one long story. When you get these extra long issues, you always feel like you're going to get some crappy filler at the end uh, but this is just one long story continuing with um, the story that was left left off at the end of last issue which was uh, the colour of fear I'm going to say uh, but we start this new storyline which can as I said it runs on from that and it's called Running Scared if you remember from the end of last issue the reverse flash had kidnapped Iris West, uh, kidnapped her to the future, to his future. Um, again, this is another writer that has been kind of laying the groundwork, leaving little tidbits here and there. Uh, the last few issues we've seen flash forwards to um, a future where the flash and the reverse flash were the greatest of friends. Um, apparently something's gone wrong and um, so it's up to the Flash to um, go and rescue Iris he using the cosmic treadmill to go into the future to save Iris and for me this was a difficult book to kind of wrap my head around I've always said about this um, this kind of rebirth title here on DC with the Flash is that it was really good for a new reader who hadn't had any um, any knowledge of the Flash because Joshua Williamson did very well in uh, letting us know what the Flash was about, knowing about his villains, knowing about the Speed Force, what it's all about, how it came to pass, etc. This issue, however, I felt like I needed to know more of the history of the Flash and his relationship with the reverse Flash, Thwain, uh, because there just seemed to be a lot of stuff that I was going, hmm, okay, kind of thing. Um, so maybe not the best issue to kind of jump on if you're a new reader although if you want to go back and read the rest of this series I would highly recommend it um, but we do kind of get this spattered kind of storyline um, history of the two together but that history is set in the future <laughs> yes it gets complicated um, and it kind of draws on Obviously, uh, Flashpoint. If anyone, if you're only new to the co to the comics, even newer than the fifty two, this will all be what is he talking about? But there are parts of this that relates to the Flashpoint, and Thwain remembers all that somehow, um, along with the Flash, who we know from previous issues and the Rebirth big super duper kicking it all off um, number one from Jeff Johns so although this was really enjoyable it was a little bit more of a tough read for me um, as always the artwork looks great in here it left a nice big um, cliffhanger at the end um, where uh, spoilers let me not forget, if you're watching this and you've not read any of my comic books yet that I'm about to show you, please stop the video so you don't get any story ruined. Um, but at the end of this, yes, Thwain rips off his mask to show his identity to the one person he's been kind of in turmoil about knowing he is 
uh, who he is, the civilian guys of Barry Allen. Um, yes, Iris West. She now knows that the Flash and Barry are the same person. Da, da, da. I do find that kind of storyline a little bit dated now. We've had it in you know, over and over again. Anyone in comic books that wears a mask always seems to have a problem telling those closest and dearest who they really are in the um, for the sake of keeping them safe because oh if they know who he really is then that automatically puts them in danger. So good issue, moved along very fast, didn't feel like an exercised issue you know the the action the 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 adventure of it all didn't slow in any way uh, despite the extra pages so i did really enjoy this despite not really knowing what was going on most of the time so i'd read one exercised anniversary issue thought i'd get the other one out of the way it's issue 25 of wonder woman and not only is this the last issue of the kind of overreaching story arc that started back in issue one, but it's also Greg Rucker's last issue um, that he's writing on as he passes the torch over to Shea Fontaine, who's on it for a little bit before a new creative team jumps on after her. Um, and this was cutesy. I'd say, despite really what goes on in here. Um, this doesn't really so much round up everything that's gone before. This is more about how Wonder Woman gets her lasso back. If you've been reading this, you will have known um, the kind of culmination of the last story arc of this 25 issue uh, run was Wonder Woman uh, taking down the two kind of demigods and she had to use her lasso to bind them and keep them prisoner. So she basically lost one of her uh, most iconic um, accessories, I guess you'd call them, um, for her kind of superhero outfit and kind of weaponry, if you want to call it that. Um, and she's mad. She's pretty mad in this issue. And the other superheroes, all the part people in the Justice League, see that too, as we kind of have this um this mission that the justice league society uh, justice league are on not the justice league society that's a completely different team um no the justice league are on this mission they see that she's a little bit miffed she she isn't her usual self and it's <clears throat> it's of course the greatest detective ever batman that notice clocks it straight away that she doesn't have her lasso anymore and the three of them, Batman, Wonder Woman and Superman, um, get together and have a little chat, find out what's wrong with her. Um, and she explains what has been basically going on in the last 25 issues, where she has been duped into believing that she's been back to Themyscira many times. But in fact, this has all been a bit of a hoax, a bit of a, not a joke, but um, to keep the secret of Themyscira safe and to keep Ares, the god of war, imprisoned. And um, that memory of how to get home was wiped from her mind. And she's not happy because it's basically a trust issue. They didn't trust her not to um, let everyone know that Themyscira, where it is, they just thought she'd blurt it out. But not really. They have a lot more faith in Wonder Woman than that. And through speaking to um, her patreons, um, all these kind of woodland animals that um, embody that these kind of, I guess, gods, um, find a way to give her another lasso and everything ends really nicely with a romantic touch with her and Steve. Uh, and it's just, I guess it's a nice ending to Greg Rucker's run. It's not hugely bombastic and big and this is my, you know, like my huge farewell. It felt very much low key, but still um, a great issue. Um, the artist saying goodbye, obviously, Liam Sharp and um, 
I always get her name wrong. I don't can't remember her first name, but Evely as well. Um, they both work on this, and it's kind of obviously reminiscent of all the art style that they've been putting on this comic for the last 25 issues. So it's it's a nice end. It's what I call a cutesy ending to this, um, but kind of looking forward to what is going to happen next with Wonder Woman, especially with a new creative team. Astro City issue number 45. Can we just let that sink in a moment? 45 issues of Astro City in a row. Astro City, this is probably, I think this is the fourth volume um, of this series. Um, it's been all over the place, but it's never ever got this far in numbers and I'm really happy because Kurt Busiak, Brett Anderson, everyone who's worked on this Vertigo series have been doing such a great job on this and when I saw this cover um, in the kind of early solicitations it got a little bit excited because we're returning back to uh, a character that was uh, brought in very early on and then we didn't see him for ages uh, but he seems very central and integral to perhaps what Kurt Busiak is or has been doing with this series up to de up to this day. So when I got into this, like I said, I was very excited. And then when I read it, I was like, oh, you just feel really stupid and thick. And I'm not sure I'm getting this because I do feel like Kurt is doing something incredibly clever here. And I'm just, my IQ levels are falling. Um, for those of you who have not been reading it or those of you who don't remember, um, <coughs> the Purple Man um, is one of those characters that kind of breaks the fourth wall and speaks directly to us, the reader. And it's it's kind of all playing around with um, the idea that, you know, he knows that this is a comic book, but it's very important comic book. Um, and there's things in here that you need to be noticing because it will um, it will mean more in the future, um, even to the point, you know, he's talking about the the title of this particular issue, which is, as he said, that'll grab them. Um, it's a crowd grabber, but then it changes to this title, ch ch changes a great David Bowie reference as if the cover alone wasn't enough. And, and then he said, oh, that's a good title, as in, you know, it's a better one uh, and it goes into this story about a superhero called Glamorax and Glamorax is um, a particularly uh, uh, w one of the particularly wilder characters of um, of the uh, Astro City uh, universe uh, almost more of a concept rather than a person uh, and through the issue we find out that indeed Glamorax has had many personalities in the past and there's kind of glimmers and shades of Doctor Who even in this in the sense that the character regenerates depending on what era they're living in uh, and we get these great... Um, um, kind of very short snippets of who uh, she, he used to be uh, and they're all characters um, that are based on people from that particular era who were rebelling against the normal society. Um, <clears throat> just trying to find, um, trying to find what they uh, were called, sorry about this, I will eventually find it, I know it's his somewhere yeah so we've got people like the bouncing beatnik uh we've got moonbeam the halcyon hippie um who else have we got zoot suit all these people that kind of were on the outskirts of society um 
but at the same time were full of culture and art and pushed those ba those boundaries. Um, and it, in a way, this is what this book is doing. It's taking um, your kind of stereotypical um, superheroes, those people like the Supermans and Batmans, and not necessarily turning it on its head, um, but using them as a filter for like new characters within the Astro City universe and seeing them from a different perspective. Um, and it's not always, um, very rarely even, about the big battles, the missions they go on. It's more about their ordinary day life as superheroes and how it affects the people surrounding them and that's what's always been great about Astra City there's this element of humanity running through it that you very rarely see in the mainstream superhero comics and for that obviously I applaud Kurt Busiak the story is wonderfully surreal exciting colorful vibrant and yes still makes me feel a bit stupid Okay, next on the reading list was X-Men Blue, issue number five. This title was doing so well. And then they trotted out a very pedestrian, unoriginal storyline that I've seen time and time again from all my years of reading books, uh, comic books, especially X titles. This happens all the time. The X-Men are taking a break um, and Jean Grey along with the Beast and Jimmy Hudson um, go to Madripoor to kind of party. Um, there's a big carnival going on in there and they, they just want to kind of let their hair down. What happens when the X-Men, whatever team they're on, happen when they let their hair down? Crap goes down. Things go wrong. And of course it happens here as they um, they see some kind of like mugging going on or um, breaking up of kind of like a drugs bust and these strange, clearly mutant characters um, kind of come to the fore and what happens? Of course, they're gonna fight. They don't talk about anything. They just fight each other for a while and then realize, oh, we're actually both the kind of good guys. Um, and it's just so like, it's like, oh, Colin Bunn, you're better than this. Um, but um, just show you some artwork as I'm going along, which actually isn't the best. Um, I think uh, Raymond Bax, who's usually a great artist, um, was very much the kind of helpful element of this. Uh, and the uh, newer artist, which is Ray Anthony Height, um, his style was more than uh, Raymond's, uh, or Ramon, sorry, Ramon Bax. He kind of took, took a back seat as much, and it's not the greatest art. Um, but this was, this was filler at best. I was very disappointed with this because I really enjoyed X-Men. Uh, basically what it is, is they've, re they've introduced some new characters, um, the group called the Raksha, and, and they may or may not have links to Jimmy Hudson. Um, so yeah, a little disappointed with X-Men Blue this week. So after the disappointment of Cullen Bunn on X-Men Blue, I hoped he would make better fare of it in Conan the Slayer, issue number 10, and um, part 4, I believe, yes, of The Devil in Iron. Um, and par for the course, it's Conan running through um, this, this mythological kind of city, trying to save a damsel in distress, while following him are oh, the baddies, but they do get their comeuppance in this issue. Uh, we saw in last issue Conan accidentally, as he does, um, set free a um, gigantic, ginormous demon um, that can't be harmed, 
without uh, this mythical sword that he's off to find uh, and daring um, escapes and danger in Fold, um, which is basically Conan the Slayer and, and lap it up. It's not the most original, but it's fun. I enjoy it. I love Conan the Slayer as, um, as a character. Um, the other series that I've been collecting from Dark Horse have been uh, just as equally fun. Um, the stories do kind of retread in a very familiar path. Um, in this issue, I did like the way it kind of turned it on the, the bad guys a bit that have set up this trap for Conan um, where this kind of giant demon... Um, found the bad guys and decided to start wreak havoc with them the leader trying to get away very fast but there's really not much depth into Conan and that's okay after once in a while for your comic books uh, I don't mind a title being like that there are many more other ones that you know there is the deepness there are the layers um, Conan is just not one of them it's just a big boys adventure uh, with a um, uh, Barbarian, Sumerian, uh, hacking and slashing his way through the pages of this comic book. Um, the artwork, um, Sergio Davila, uh, it's always pretty damn good. Um, he draws a really great, he draws a really great Conan, uh, and the action is always fun to look at and read. Um, there's always a big monster for. Um, for him to draw and there's always um, a kind of pretty damsel for him to to draw um, big demons for him to um, put down on the page obviously there's always the scantily clad lady um, just fun stuff nothing great but see it's definitely nothing bad issue number 44 of saga kind of put off reading this after last uh, the last issue that came out because I, I was not turned off by it but I just felt it was shoving uh, uh, an agenda down my throat a little too hard um, and in this issue again there's something that Brian K. Vaughan and Fiona Stemple, Fiona Staples really want you to um, think about and that is the whole idea of abortion and the rights of the woman and this isn't about that um, this isn't my channel uh, to talk about that um, but we are continuing that trend with this issue as the weirdness continues um, Saga has always been kind of out there but there's been a holding of the reins so to speak it hasn't gone so far and um, it's one of the things that I miss most about Saga which is always a good book it's always a solid read it I can't imagine Saga ever being off my pull list uh, I've been with this book from the very very start and been a big champion of it right at the very beginning but I think in a way and um, in the last maybe issues as well I want it to get back to the the universe of Saga uh, and all the characters that are involved in it that we've kind of left behind for maybe a little bit too long um, and stop focusing so much on the, the family unit, um, however screwed up it, it is. Um, but we kick off this issue with a another couple, um, uh, clearly from the wings on them, the, um, the, are they the, are they the wreaths? I can't remember now. I think they're the wreaths with, with the, um, with the wings. Uh, but obviously she's pregnant and she wants to abort it and they're off to abortion town. Um, but along the way they meet some more new crazy characters um this guy horse and a torso of of a man together 
that Brian Gable and Fiona Staples always want to shock us. Um, and they don't really get very far because these bands of kind of outlaws, I guess you'd call them, um, shoot them both dead. Um, so we go back to the family and Alana's still not having a great time. Um, she's being sick with black goo all over the place as the... Um, as the baby that's still dead inside her still has to be um, extracted and that's why they have to go to this um, this place that's not abortion town but will kind of remove babies that are even further along that even abortion town won't um, get rid of. Uh, of course in the last issue Alana suddenly had uh, new powers she can now um, throw flames in this issue we see her kind of messing around with wind so it feels very elemental um, and, and so they have to find a way to get there and so they find a big train that it's got a big face on it. Um, <laughs> it's just the craziness. Um, and then there's all this weirdness with Alana having bad nightmares. Um, the, the dreams are kind of, can I show this? Why not? This is an adult channel. Um, she's having these kind of sexy dreams, but they kind of turn into um, a bit of a nightmare and, and wakes up. And then in front of her, I'm clearly hallucinating, but it's her son. Now, whether this is going to be a twist on Hazel's next kind of growth spurt where we all thought she was a girl, but now she's a boy. And, you know, Fiona Staples and Brian K. Vaughan can now throw in some transgender um, issues in there. Who knows what this book is going to push um, the envelope on next. But I'll still be picking it up. I'll still be reading it. And um, if you like Saga, you're still going to. Um, if you haven't read Saga yet, I'd say you're going to really enjoy the first few volumes. If you pick it up in trade, just prepare for the weirdness after that. A book that I came to with much trepidation, for those of you who've been watching my videos uh, for a while, you know that I haven't been really enjoying this um, iteration of The Punisher written by Beck and Cloonan, but issue 13 actually wasn't that bad. Um, it's a done in one in story, maybe that's why it was better than the previous story arcs. That might be a way to go, Becky, I don't know. But what she really did well in this issue um, uh, and kind of reminded me of past Punisher stories and the way it works is not so much coincidence, but the way that a scenario that starts in the, the beginning of this book leads him onto the next thing, onto the next thing, to the ultimate thing um, of Punisher putting down a bad person. And this story kicks off with the Punisher finding out after coming back from, I think it was Canada and the Arctic or wherever he was, um, that one of his secret hideouts has been found and someone stolen a gun from his stash. And um, the people that have done that is just a bunch of school kids. Of course, the Punisher has got surveillance and he goes to find the kid um, who leads him to a kind of porn broker where he sold it so he can buy a computer game. Uh, the porn broker has sold it to a woman who he tracks down and finds out is getting uh, beaten up by her boyfriend, husband, and it's up to, it's up to Punisher to put him down. And, and there's that kind of choices that are made by all the characters. Uh, and it's just, like I said, it's just so well done. Punisher stopping uh, people from being bad, that, that he, although he's about justice and, you know, he, he will go to the nth degree to put these people down. There's an element that he's seeing degrees of um, kind of law breaking now. Uh, not that he hasn't necessarily in the past, but normally he would be more gung-ho about it. But now there's, 
in this run there's a lot more kind of more intimidation to the characters he comes across and only deals out that final punishment for those who truly truly need it uh, new artist on here Chris Anker um, isn't that bad um, fortunately he's got Matt Wilson as the colorist so we get some uh, kind of great moody shots like those um, but for the most part it's it's kind of a weird, um, maybe uh, parts of this, the more colourful, the bright side of this uh, isn't Matt Wilson's friend because it feels very um, almost kind of like photoshopped or not, not even photoshopped. No, it feels like it's aping a dated style, but in uh, a modern way. Get your head around that one. Um, but it wasn't, it wasn't bad. It just felt very different to what we've had um, over the last um, 12 issues. But surprisingly enough, Punisher got better this month. Of all the books that I picked up this week, this is the one that I thought I'd be reading first because of the ending of the last one by Bill Willingham. Uh, I'm Again, spoilers, if you've not read the last issue, um, stop this video. It's been a month, come on guys. Um, but at the end of the last issue, we saw Commandy stretched out on a kind of gurney, his, all his guts ripped out, and basically he was dead. Uh, and that car was the cliffhanger for now writer Steve Orlando and artist Billy Tan, uh, sorry, Philip Tan, not Billy Tan, Philip Tan, um, to pick that cliffhanger up and somehow try and save Commandy. Uh, and while I really didn't like that, I thought they'd taken the, the joyful, not innocence, but the, the joy of, uh, of Kirby's Commandy and just really literally uh, on the page bludgeoned it to death. I'm all for modern takes on characters that came from the, the 70s, but at least stay somewhat true to that, what you are, what you're homaging, what you're paying tribute to. Um, just remember, yes, this is a tribute to Jack Kirby. This is to celebrate um, the the hundred he, he would have been a hundred yes sorry um and it's just why 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 do this so anyway i opened this book up so many times and just couldn't bring myself to start reading it which is why i read so many others before this but in the end of course i did and Scientific MacGuffins comes in and saves the day. I almost thought that they were going to kind of lead it to a kind of clone version of Commandy, which would made it a little bit more interesting. But basically, it was a case of sewing him back up and, like I say, science guffin, uh, which um, was lucky as. Um, it leads them on to um, obviously the next adventure where they get captured by um, a bunch of bears basically it's that it's the nation of bears uh, and there's almost this um, kind of hive collective mind going on in this um, community uh, this is their leader and you can see the this strange kind of crown um, thing he's got on but this is feeding him all the thoughts um, of the the bear community uh, and it's kind of like this huge jury so to speak uh, they decide what is going to happen to like Commandy um, having intruded on their land um, but this particular bear who's, con who's currently running the community uh, decides to rebel and basically uses Commandy as an excuse to um, kind of shake off though that pressure of making the decisions um, and uh, of the collective community. It was okay I do feel as optimistic as I was about this series right at the very beginning that 
especially the last couple of issues, the excitement of this, the joyful innocence and adventure that this book has brought has started to decline. Uh, and I can't believe it came from Bill Willingham, uh, Steve Orlando, not done a huge amount of work, at least not um, kind of like big mainstream uh, stuff. So maybe that's the problem. Uh, we've had a lot of really big popular names to begin with who have really brought, you know, not necessarily their A game, but a, a, a joyful game to Commandy Challenge. Or maybe this challenge has just kind of run its course now. But still, it's Commandy, and if you've got a Commandy title on the shelf, I'm going to pick it up. The final book I read this week, and only because it's one of the thicker books and I knew it was going to be a hefty read to get through, is Dustin Weaver's Packless, issue number two. A sort of anthology series um, that is very heavily sci-fi influenced and really should be right up my street. Sci-fi, fantasy, all that good stuff um, is, is my kind of wheelhouse. In this issue there are, there's a big story, there's the ongoing story of um, the Amina cycle um, which um, has just, it has a story, it has a story, it just feels very, very fragmented uh, and kind of jumps all over the place as we, as we go from um, the character Tara um, who, who picked up Amnia, this kind of alien that fell to the ground and fell um, some sort of pressure to save this this kind of alien female character and go against um, the community the 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 army I guess that she um, is part of uh, and strikes out to go and and find her again but trouble in her way uh, and then you have the people back at home and the the heads of this army the leaders the captains who are sending people out to go and find her and then we have this I guess an alien race that is against this army it just feels a bit chaotic uh, and not incredibly streamlined uh, and maybe this is more a a uh, uh, labour of love, uh, something that Dustin Weaver has wanted to do for a long time, but hasn't necessarily thought it through a great deal. Um, but I enjoyed it, despite the chaotic nature of that storyline. Um, the first storyline, I mean, God, if you want nonsensical um, storytelling, um, an empty shell in the ocean is the first story. Uh, and this is drawn by um, Dustin Weaver with the storyline by DJ Bryan. And if you kind of read the, the little excerpts at the back, um, even uh, the writer said, here's a story that makes no sense. Well, he was not joking. This story, as as lovely as it looked, and the artwork on this is just is just really nice to look at. This story just was like, what is happening? You have this guy who's on some sort of stakeout, but he's more interested in looking at this woman through um, her window and they kind of meet and it's all very awkward he can't talk to her um this big robot robotic half man half robot creature comes out and starts attacking him it's all over the place um and it doesn't even and it, it's just a done in one and there's no sense to it i as pretty as it looked, I was just like, what was that? What was this writer trying to to say here? And I'm just like, am I, can I, am I, can I pick this up again? Um, 
it's a five ninety nine book, and I'm not saying I can't afford it, but I could get maybe another two books if I added an extra pound on um, that will one make sense and go in a linear path. And I'm all for books that go kind of digress and go off uh, and tell um, a kind of diversionary story rather than from A to B to C to the to the end of the story. But this was just ah! That was packless. So what was my pick of the week from all those books? Was it the craziness of packless? No. Was it the continuing greatness that was Exo Man of War with new artist? No. Was it the culmination of Greg Rucker's 25 issue run on the Rebirth Wonder Woman? No. I'm giving my pick of the week this week, despite not, despite feeling a little stupid while reading it, but it deserves it, and I'm going to read it again to try and make sense and pick some other bits up. But Astro City issue number forty-five uh, was my pick of the week. Just a fantastic book, and I just know Kurt Busiak knows what he's doing here. He has a plan. He has set this up from the very beginning and it's just idiots like me who can't see it. But I know there's genius there. I know there's brilliance. Uh, and the story in here was just so appealing um, with this kind of glam rock superhero in the Astro City universe about to turn into a, a yet another new version of him herself. That was my pick of the week. Should have been yours too. But please do let me know in the comments section down below of the books that you read this week what you found the most appealing. So thank you very much for watching. Until next time don't forget to thumb this video up. Tell me what were your favourite books this week in the comments section below. And if you're new to my channel please hit the red subscribe button and join me a week in week out with more comic books. Until next time, bye bye.